everyone, thank you for joining me on this episode of Represent NYC on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. My name is Yuli New, and I am the New York State Assembly Member representing the 65th District of New York, which includes Battery Park City, Chinatown, the Financial District, Lower East Side, and the South Street Seaport. In today's episode, we are going to discuss housing and rent laws in New York State. The past legislative session, as a member of the Assembly Committee on Housing, we worked to pass a massive and historic housing and rent law package. These laws work to ensure that New Yorkers have access to a more fair and affordable housing system. I'm excited today to be joined by some brilliant experts and advocates, and here with me today are Ellen Davidson, the staff attorney from Legal Aid Society, Elise High Street, the uh, organizer from Goals, good old Lower East Side, and Megan White, the staff attorney from Mobilization for Justice. Thank you all for joining me today. Ellen, please let us know a little bit about Legal Aid Society. Well, the Legal Aid Society um, is the oldest and uh, probably the largest law firm in the country that represents low-income um, people in criminal, family court, and civil legal services. I'm a housing attorney, um, and we represent tenants in all five boroughs um, in uh, all sorts of proceedings from housing court to administrative hearings to federal court. Um, and uh, we spent a lot of time up in Albany this year um, working to try to get uh, better, better laws for our clients. You also spend a lot of time in my district. I do. I do. Well, I mean, my, our main office is in your district. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I pass your office uh, going, to my, uh, going from the subway to my office every single day. Um, and uh, so, yes, I spent a lot of time in your district. <laughs> <laughs> and we spend a lot of time also working with a lot of the tenants in the Lower East Side. So I um, would love to uh, hear a little bit more about Golez as well for the public. So Go to Lower East Side is a local community organization. It's been in existence for over 40 years, and we work to keep people in their homes and in the community through direct services and also through organizing campaigns on various issues. Appreciate it. Megan, tell us a little bit about MFJ. So sure, MFJ is a civil legal services organization. We represent tenants in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. Um, just like Ellen and the, Lo and the Legal Aid Society, we represent tenants in housing court, administrative proceedings, um, Supreme Court, and occasionally in federal court. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, as we are um, kind of getting out there and talking to tenants and folks about some of the big changes. Um, looking back, what are some of the biggest changes to our rent laws that we made this session? And, and why are these rent laws so important? I know that you've been in the fight for the longest, Ellen. Yeah, um, there are so many parts of this law that are extraordinary. Um, I, and, 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 uh, Picking my favorite part of the law is a little bit like picking a favorite child, um, <laughs> because there's just uh, you know each and every one is extraordinary. Um, so I think what the laws really did, um, you know, when we were when uh, Legal Aid Society was part of Housing Justice for All, the campaign, the Upstate Downstate Housing Alliance, the coalition that was seeking to change the laws, and we had a a platform of about, uh, with 10 bills on it that we, or I'm sorry, no, nine, nine bills on it that we were pushing in Albany. Um, and every once in a while, someone would say, can you, can you prioritize? Right. And we would come back and say no, because uh, every single one of the things that we were trying to reform were uh, levers that made uh, life uh, incredibly uh, horrible for tenants in New York um, from the fact that landlords were constantly seeking the goal of deregulating units, um, that preferential rent tenants who might think they were getting a break on their rent from their landlords were actually in terrible situations where they could each and every lease term face hundreds of dollars of increases. Um, the uh, incentives landlords got for getting in an apartment empty um, and major capital improvements, uh, not to mention what was going on with rent control tenants. Um, and we said we can't just fix one problem, we have to fix it all. And the thing I think that for me is the most important part of this bill 
is it hits so many of the different areas that we talked about as being problematic for so many years. And so many of them are connected. They're all connected. Mm -hmm. They're all connected. Um, you know, when you create a system which incentivizes landlords to uh, empty out apartments, you incentivize harassment. When you incentivize a system where landlords are uh, held to the honor system about what the rent should be in an apartment, you end up with massive amounts of fraud. Um, and so if you don't deal with every single thing at the same time, um, you just end up coming back to Albany next year saying things still are terrible. And instead, this was, this was historic because it hit so many different areas of the rent laws. And one of the biggest um, historic aspects of the rent laws was definitely that, you know, it's forever now. It's permanent. So, you know, before we had to go back all the time. So right. what, what do you think is the impact of that on the legislature and on tenants? I think on tenants and around organizing, you know, in the past it's every, you know, four years or whatever it was, you have to start this whole new campaign and bring people back together around it to fight for something. Whereas now it's like we did this one big thing this year and it passed and it's super exciting and now we don't have to start over every four years. Mm -hmm. So obviously there's still the possibility that you know they can amend or change the laws but in a different way and it doesn't sunset. So I think in the organizing uh, view it makes it a lot easier for, for us to really focus on all the other things that are going on besides just the laws. And you can really build on what's this incredible foundation that has already been achieved. Um, I know that you know, universal rent control was something that didn't pass, and that's something to look forward to in the next legislative se session. So it's really exciting to have this really strong foundation to build upon. So many constituents, even in my district, have asked why their rents have gone up so much in the last couple of years. Um, what can they do to verify that these increases are actually fair? It's not so much whether they're fair, it's whether they're legal. Mm -hmm. um, and so if a tenant is rent stabilized, and a tenant should figure out whether they're rent stabilized or not, um, they should go to the state housing um, uh, homes and community renewal um, and ask for a rent registration and then go and look at the rent registration and see whether the increases were what were, the landlord was legally able to take. And where are the registries to figure out if a lease is rent stabilized or under preferential rent or any of the other things that are protected? So you can um, call HCR. They now have an online portal that you can also do it through. You can call 311 and they'll also direct you. There's many ways to do it. Um, your landlord doesn't know when you request it, which is great. So you can request it. Um, it gets sent to you very quickly to your address. And then you can either look over it yourself or you can also go to a local community organization like Goals and someone can look through it with you and advise you on what to do next and what's actually legal because it can be daunting to look at. Do you guys want to just give really quickly for um, the viewing audience a little bit like uh, maybe your number and who to call um, in your offices to make sure that they can help with that? Um, uh, so if you are a tenant in Manhattan, um, our um, our main office is 212-577-3300. Uh, uh, um, the office that represents uh, tenants in housing court and advises tenants in housing court um, is our um, Harlem Community Law Office. Thank you so much. Um, and any tenants who live in the Lower East Side can give a call to Goals at 212-533-2541. Even if you don't live in the Lower East Side, you can give us a call and we can refer you to another organization that covers your area. And um, if you live in Manhattan, you can call MFJ. Um, our telephone number is 212-417-3700. Um, and they can direct you to uh, our hotline, which is actually open on Mondays and Wednesdays from 2 to 4.30. And that telephone number is 212-417-3888. Thank you so much, guys. Um, so what should tenants be on the lookout for? when they're entering a new lease or renewing a lease um, after the laws have passed now? Um, again, it, it depends on whether you're um, entering into a rent-regulated apartment or not. Mm -hmm. um, but all tenants, um, and, and one of the reasons that this law was so historic was it only, didn't only deal with rent-regulated tenants, but all tenants, uh, if you're entering a new lease, 
the uh, any application fees you have to pay for the apartment should be no more than twenty dollars. The security deposit that the landlord asks for should be no more than one month's rent. So those are two things that people entering into new leases should be looking for. To the extent that uh, you're a rent regulated tenant, you have your landlord has to renew your lease on the same terms and conditions as the previous lease. That's one of the parts of the law that remain the same. Um, if, uh, if you had a preferential rent previously, your landlord can no longer take it away. Um, so you should be keeping an eye out on that. Um, and if you, if you are a rent regulated tenant and your landlord previously asked for more than one month's security deposit, you should be asking for that, uh, the overpayment to be given back to you. Um, and uh, there's a part of the law that hasn't gone into effect yet. It will go into effect in October. So looking forward, um, if you're an unregulated tenant, you will have more notice if your landlord intends to either increase your rent by more than 5% or not renew your lease. Um, so as of October, if you've lived in your apartment for more than a year, you will get 60 days notice of non-renewal or 5% rent increase. And if it's been for more than two years, you'll get a 90-day notice of non-renewal or 5% re uh, over 5% rent increase. So the landlords can choose to not renew? If you are not regulated, um, that's a, by definition, the landlord can choose to uh, not renew your lease. Um, we fought very hard uh, for a bill that would require landlords to not renew only if they had a good reason to. Um, and that was unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. um, but that is what, um, you know, the stories that, that break your heart. I, I, uh, one of your colleagues, a constituent services from one of your colleagues, wrote to me this week about a um, elderly constituent who lived in his apartment for 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a one to two family home, has no regulations. Um, the landlord died, his children have taken over, um, and he's been, uh, he's been given one month to leave um, wow. his home of 30 years. Um, and who knows where he's going to end up because, um, you know, changing your life after 30 years as an elderly New Yorker is not easy. And so the good cause eviction bill, um, we, you know, that's what we've been calling it. Um, that would have prevented something like that from happening? Yes, yes it would. It, it would have required landlords to come up with a, a reason for evicting a tenant and it couldn't just be, I don't want you to be here after 30 years anymore. Mm. Um, so being on the Lower East Side and um, also knowing uh, some of the worst landlords in New York, mm -hmm. um, what are some common behaviors from bad landlords that we see? I mean, harassment is a big one. Everyone has their own sort of interpretations of what exactly that means, but we've seen a lot of harassment through construction, um, both illegal construction, harassment just the way that, you know, landlords talk to their tenants, things like that. Um, or we've lately seen a lot of lease renewals just be faulty. So like a lot of preferential rent, they don't actually list it mm -hmm. the correct way and they add riders and things like that that are really confusing to people using weird language that, you know, makes people worry that they won't be able to stay in their apartment after, you know, this current lease is up. Um, a lot of uh, conjoining apartments or dividing apartments. There's a lot of predatory equity in the Lower East Side, um, and we're eager to see how that shifts under these new laws, because now that they don't have those incentives or some of the incentives anymore, um, it's going to make a big difference. I heard you mention that there are some different priorities that you guys are seeing already for the future. Um, would love to kind of hear from all of you on what you think that uh, would look like. So what are some of the things that the legislature still hasn't um, you know, done, like good cause eviction uh, and, and some of the other things that you think that we need to do better uh, when, when we get up to Albany next year? I mean, Ellen's story that she told is a, a tale that so many legal services providers have heard over and over again. You have families that live in two to three family apartment buildings who for years and years have had good relationships with their landlords and suddenly something happens and they're forced to leave their home of a very long time. I represent a woman in Brooklyn who is being forced out of her home of 15 years with her two minor children 
and she's and she has a Section 8 voucher, and she's finding it increasingly difficult to find somewhere to live. I think that there's things that can be done around strengthening um, discrimination around your source of income. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks have vouchers or subsidies from the city, and they find it very, very difficult to find a place to live um, because brokers or landlords don't want to take these subsidies, though they're not supposed to, all, though they're not supposed to discriminate already, mm -hmm. they do it with impunity because there's no real consequences. Um, I know goals pushed very hard during the rent law fight to eliminate MCIs. Mm -hmm. And while, you know, big changes have been made and we're really excited about that, we would love to see the MCI program eliminated completely. Mm -hmm. um, we don't believe that the burden of improvement should be on the tenants since when they leave their apartment, they don't get to take you know, the roof with them or the intercom systems with them. So that's something I would love to see. Um, what I'd like to see, besides good cause eviction, um, is uh, a real commitment on the part of the legislature and the governor to um, funding housing. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to see housing stability support passed. Um, real, uh, I would like to see billions of dollars going to public housing across yes. the state, as well as building real, truly, deeply affordable housing. We have um, a, uh, a, a public housing system that is not only in New York City, but outside of New York City, um, because of the years and decades of disinvestment, um, increasingly uh, falling down around tenants' ears. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the state has an obligation to uh, fund that. Um, and additionally, we have a homelessness crisis that is out of control, both inside New York City and outside of New York City. And I think the only way we stop that is to actually start building both supportive housing and deeply, new deeply affordable housing. I mean, you know, the things that you guys mentioned right now are so crucial and key. I think one of the things that we definitely have not discussed is uh, in the legislature is um, not just, you know, every single budget putting in a little bit more for NYCHA, a little bit more for NYCHA, a little bit more for NYCHA, but we need to actually look at how we can permanently um, figure out how the state can, can fix public housing um, yeah. and, and how we deal with public housing. And I think for me, that's one of the biggest issues. Um, and, and, you know, every single winter, I have to say, yeah. we already know we're going to have heat and hot mm -hmm. water issues. Why? Why are we still having these issues every single winter if we already know that they're coming, mm -hmm. you know? And so um, I, I appreciate all of you guys for your advocacy. Um, I, I kind of wanted to delve a little bit more into your issue on Section 8. Like, what, what is exactly um, can we do, since it's a federal program, what can we do on the state level to really be able to help navigate some of the situations around Section 8? Well, you know, some states, Massachusetts, for example, has created its own voucher program. Mm. Um, and I certainly think that, you know, we have um, a certain amount of vouchers. Um, but um, all the waiting lists have at least 100,000 people on them. Um, and they're not, there are no new vouchers. So uh, one of the things I'd like to see is uh, the state create its own voucher program, uh, just like Massachusetts. Uh, because I think we now have like the strongest rent laws um, because of what the legislature did this year. Um, and I think we should continue to be the leaders, the leader of uh, when it comes to housing mm. um, and making sure people are able to afford where they live. So I know that all of you have worked on so many different cases um, that drove the legislation this year. Um, I would love to know, um, you know, particularly, you mentioned the MCI program, um, if there were any things that you saw that made it so that it was so clear that we needed to work on um, you know, fixing the MCI program or eliminating the MCI program. Yeah, um, so we work closely with groups in Queens that have been experiencing uh, very high MCI increases. Um, and we have a building in our district that they've had, I think, five or six in the last like maybe seven or eight years. So the fact that you know, every two years they're getting this increase on top of their regular increase um, and that when they leave, they're not taking that with them, it just doesn't make sense. Um, so those two things kind of combined 
makes it really important for us. And there's just there's so many stories out there about about MCIs and the fact that they're not regulated very well and landlords take advantage of them. They're not really used for what they were made for. And that's why it's super important, I think, for us. Yeah, we um, we dealt with uh, particularly in the Bronx. We were seeing one landlord in particular. He would come in and he would purchase a building, um, and then he would uh, replace all the kitchens and bathrooms. Mm -hmm. And so, if you were living in that building, you were not able to use your kitchen and bathroom because it was being replaced. You might have to, for a number of months, use the bathroom that everybody was using on your floor or, uh, you know, upstairs, um, and. The tenants suffered through just terrible construction um, abuse, um, and at the end of it, they saw increases to their rent. Now, luckily, that was a loophole that was closed by the new rent laws. Landlords can no longer come in to do individual apartment improvements and call it an MCI. Um, and so, uh, so that was certainly um, uh, cases that we were doing that was. Uh, and, and people who came and testified and articles in the paper that I think was what uh, the legislature responded to in some of the reforms uh, that MCIs were having. And I think we need to look um, as we go forward to see whether um, the same incentives for harassment are there or there are new, uh, new things that landlords figure out that they can do to make tenants' lives miserable. Um, I expect a lot of not just not following the law. What have you guys seen anything so far um, that have uh, kind of triggered some of these warning signs? Um, certainly, when it came to preferential rents, I've seen a lot of stories of landlords just refusing to follow the law. Uh, the law said that uh, if your lease came up after June 14th and you had a preferential rent, your your lease renewal needed to be based on your last preferential rent. I mean, that's what the law said. And landlords said they weren't going to do it. Um, when it comes to application fees, um, the law says no more than $20, no more than one month's rent. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. landlords are saying, well, if you, demand, if you stand on your rights, you're a troublemaker. I'm not signing a lease with you. So you guys are seeing the same things that are happening? I mean, I personally have been looking for my own apartment over the last month, and I've seen so many listings that they're charging these illegal amounts, but it's the same thing that you're saying. Like, I'm not going to go and tell them that this is the illegal amount because then I probably won't get the apartment. So I just mm -hmm. avoid them. You know, and I'm lucky to have the privilege where I have more options available to me, but a lot of people don't have those options. And the preferential rent thing, I mean, I've worked with maybe like five or six different people over the past couple months whose leases are faulty around the preferential rent issue. So if people are seeing some of these things happening, um, you know, whether or not it's on a listing that they are trying to apply to, what should they do? And if it's happening to them, where do they turn? Well, as far as the preferential rent um, goes, if you get a lease that you believe to be faulty or illegal, you, should ref you can refuse to sign it. Mm -hmm. You will very likely be taken to housing court. And obviously, when you're in court, it, there's a lot of um, power and privilege surrounding landlords and their attorneys. Some tenants don't always get an attorney, um, but you can explain to the judge, or if you're able to get an attorney, an attorney can explain to the judge, this is an illegal increase. I had a preferential rent before. My lease was up after June 14th, 2019. I believe this to be incorrect. Um, you can also seek assistance from the Legal Aid Society or MFJ. Um, and I imagine that um, many elected officials, constituent services could absolutely be of assistance um, to folks seeing those um, illegal increases. I mean, security deposits are supposed to be overseen by the Attorney General, or I don't know, supposed to, but are overseen by the Attorney General. And we're encouraging people who are running into these security deposit issues to uh, reach out to this um, uh, attorney general's office. Um, and f application fees, it's hard to figure out who's responsible for overseeing them. Um, to the extent that it's the broker who's, who's charging more, um, the Department of State oversees brokers. Um, and I think complaints to the Department of State about brokers um, could affect their licenses. So I would encourage people to reach out to the Department of State. And for one last thing I just wanted to kind of ask was um, if 
if um, folks are getting those uh, application fees, like, should they report it somewhere? I mean, that's what I'm, uh, if it's coming from a broker, I would suggest going to the Department of State, but it's, the law, there's no one who previously oversaw application fees. Mm. So it's just not clear who's the agency that is responsible for making sure that the landlords follow the law. Because so even if it's not their, the lease that they end up signing because they're like, wow, this guy obviously isn't following the yeah. law, I shouldn't sign this lease, you know, what, what makes it so that people can actually be helpful in trying to stop that behavior? I mean, one would think that the legislature passed a law that people would follow it. Um, but it, the real estate industry is used to like ignoring the law and figuring out how to force a business community to start following the law is, is, is difficult if there's no one agency that's tasked with uh, making sure that law gets uh, enforced. All right. Well, thank you so much, you guys, for helping us to figure out all of the things that we actually need to still keep doing. <laughs> so thank you so much, and um, I appreciate all of your time. Thank, thank you for having us. The new rent and housing laws are something that all New Yorkers can be proud of. While we still have much work to do, these regulations are a major step forward to improving housing affordability and tenant protections. In our state, for far too long, our broken housing laws have created a system that works against us. New Yorkers deserve better, and we must work to create further policies that ensure housing is a right and not a privilege. Thank you to the viewers for tuning in to another episode of Represent NYC. For Represent NYC, I'm Yulene New, and you can follow me on Twitter at, at Yulene, Y-U-H-L-I-N-E, or contact me at my office at 212-312-1420 with any suggestions you have about how to tackle the issue for uh, general questions or any comments. Thank you for watching Represent NYC on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. <laughs>